We know that one of the most critical things for fauna, and especially a range of Australian fauna, are the presence of hollows within a landscape. We've spent the last 200 or so years effectively wiping out many of the hollows that would naturally have occurred and the species that would have been in those spaces by providing the homes and providing these spaces back in the landscape for fauna we can let them re start to re-inhabit these these um, lands where they really should be and providing the services that they do so through my process which is the hollow hog and the hollow hog tools we intend to try and put hollows directly back into trees knowing that these are spaces that fauna are used to using and that they've got the highest chance of lasting long into the future. If we planted a tree today, it might not be until 120 years until we get a hollow that's that large. And if that's the case, well, it's going to be 120 years before we can get fauna back in. So if we can fast track that process and bring fauna back in, they can provide all of those ecosystem services at a much younger stage in that regeneration process. That's, that's the tool. So this is the hollow hog. And what effectively it is, is a high speed cutting head that's got tungsten carbide teeth. So three tungsten carbide teeth on it. And it spins at about 11,000 RPM, which is based on the, the speed of the grinder. It's got a long spindle, which means that where I can then put that whole length inside the tree it's got a dust extraction coupling, so this, the, all the wood dust as I'm carving gets sucked up the tube and then spat out by a blowback. Unlike, say, for example, an auger drill, which spins and wants to keep me on a one straight line through, whatever I can reach inside a tree, I can carve out. Once I go through the entrance of, the, of hollow, which is five centimetres, I can then start going down and up and sideways and just keep going round and round and round and whatever I can reach. So in this instance, that's about 40 to 45 centimetres. So I can go 45 centimetres up, 45 centimetres down, and side to side. So that's a powerful outsize hollow. That could be done, if I wanted to, through an entrance hole that small. And this is the second tool that we started, made. So same cutting head, but just on a spindle that spins. And that will go do exactly the same job except it doesn't suck out all the wood dust as you're going so we use it for different applications so that, that one's called the piglet so that's the hog and that's the piglet hog as in hogging timber is a term for woodworking you're hogging out that wood there's now about uh, 200 to 250 people with the tools that are using them around Australia. So that's everywhere from Tassie to WA, Queensland, all throughout Vic and New South Wales. Um, yeah, loads of hollows going in, which is fantastic. Lots of really interesting things that are starting to investigate and use the hollows. If I bought an S-Box, that was um, say 40 centimetres by 20 centimetres by 20 centimetres. That's what I've got. I've got a structure that will remain that size until the bottom falls out of it and it falls on the forest floor. With a hollow that you've carved, it might start out that you've carved an entrance that size and a chamber this big. And by the time uh, I'm well and truly gone and 120 or 150 years time it might be a hollow that's this size and then if it lives to 400 years you might have a whopping great big hollow so we've effectively created a space that will grow over time and provide a, a space and a habitat for a whole raft of different species once I remove that living tissue for it to, to, to effectively seal over that space it, it grows new tissue from the sides so that new tissue will creep out across and eventually seal that space that was on its stem off that um, process in itself was something that i kind of was looking at and thinking about and okay how can we work with this eventually came up with this concept which i just call apple coring so i carved my hollow and that then just gets shaped. Imagine that there's bark and living tissue there.
Okay, so say that was to there. That slots in like that. Living tissue, it's nicely lined up. The living tissue will go straight into that rebate. Within a year, it ain't coming out. So that would have a bead of just roof and gutter silicon put on the back to seal it. And then it would have two screws. Just one screw there and one screw there, so screwed into the side. And so once that new tissue growth grows in to that um, rebate, it's biologically then anchored. And it's just effectively like a branch stub from the perspective of a bird or anything else that's gonna use that hollow. I've been doing that now for about two and a half years and it's worked perfectly in almost every situation where the tree just locks it into place and that's it. One of the crit most critical factors for usage for not all species but a lot of species will be that entrance size. The chamber size does matter to a degree so squirrel and sugar gliders for example will hang out in little family groups and they'll cuddle up together at certain times of year to warm, just keep nice and warm. And you might have three or four or, or five gliders that will um, build themselves a little nest out of leaf in the base of a hollow. So the cavity itself needs to be big enough to accommodate that many gliders. So they've got this classic footage of a squirrel glider. It's able to squeeze its head in and its front limbs in. And then the back legs are kind of like doing this at the back and it just kind of like eventually must, I don't know what it does, whether it dislocates a limb or something, but it pops in and eventually gets into that hollow. But from its perspective, it's ideal because the lace monitor that also investigates that hollow can't get in to, to eat it or, um, or one of the larger pythons that live in that space are not gonna get in there. Um, and so for, for lots of species, they will look at that and they will decide whether or not there you're gonna use a hollow. Originally I carved the entrance, it was five centimeters and slightly longer and I got no usage at all by the gliders in the first year and a half. The tree then started to slowly grow that over and it got to a certain size, Ooh, little Latoria phallax, the little dwarf tree frog calling away. Um, the entrance size started to narrow up, the gliders found it, then they've just maintained that entrance to just so they can get in. I agree, I agree and I think it's under estimated what they're doing um people because they're a native species people automatically think oh well that's just natural but we seem to have changed the dynamic somehow that they they seem to me to be one of the major limiting factors for a whole range of species cats do climb trees cats will look inside a hollow but um you're probably more likely to find that a lace monitor has a greater ability to get inside to take out some of the fauna that we're trying to provide homes for a lace monitor has a big long body. So if I can make a entrance that will come out this way and then have quite a sharp bend, they won't necessarily be able to turn and get their body around it. So I've been trialing things like that. To do that, I'd carve in from here and then I'd carve the remainder and meet it in that way. And that gives me the bend. So yeah, any questions at all about anything? Yeah, when's the best time to carve a hollow? Yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Um, look, I've geared it really for arborists and others and commercial kind of groups, but definitely land care groups, 100%. Land care groups have bought the tools. You can make the salvage log, people can help make all the entrance pieces, all of those things. And then you get a grant, you get a climbing arborist in for a day, you work as their groundie or whatever it happens to be, you help and they carve, carve, carve for you install all these beautiful entrances you've made in all the spots and you get a fantastic outcome. You're drilling this into a live tree or a dead tree? Both live and dead. So that's something which can take a little bit to wrap your head around the concept of. Um, and for some people, it's a, they don't want to touch live trees and that's, that's fine. Um, but we recognize that there are lots of species that will only um, want a nest in a live tree. Live trees will, if we carve correctly, will last um, for a lot longer than a, a dead standing tree, for example. We will get instances where we go in and put hollows into 
you know, 1% of the trees on a property, it's not going to have any kind of ecological impact to the number of trees that are there. Whereas you might 100% ensure that a fauna population remains on site or can re-establish itself. It's that balance between thinking from an individual tree's health perspective and the whole forest community health perspective. And for my mind, I'd go for the forest community health perspective every time, except for where there's a potential for failure on human uh, people and structures. We have a dead tree, which is 20, year, 20 years ago it died. Yep. Um, I've left it there because I was hoping that the hollows would form naturally. Yep. Is there any point in using a dead tree? Yep. Yep, 100%. And being done, you could do all sorts of things from carving with a chainsaw, little narrow slits that become home for microbats, through to carving small chambers to bigger ones. Well, how important is <laughs> height relative yep. to uh, the species that you find in it? So that's, that's also a super important question. And if you read a lot of things about nest boxes, it'll say nest boxes work from 3 metres to 6 metres. Why is that? Well, that is the minimum height um, that you can stretch up with a pole and the maximum height you can stretch up with a pole to have a look and monitor your site. It doesn't mean that, that fauna won't use things that are higher or lower. They'll use whatever the best available space is. When people talk about we've got whatever species using a hollow or a nest box at three metres, that might be an appropriate height in a forest that's say nine meters tall out in the woodland territory on the other side of the ranges. But you come into a forest with blue gums that's got a 60 meter tall blue gum, from the species perspective, it actually feels like it's on the ground. So I think of it more of a proportion of that tree's height. I'd be saying, aim at trying to put your hollows as high as you can, if you can. And if you can get them in the top third, unreal. Not the same for all species, so for example, a Antichinus or something like that, and will happily use a hollow on closer to the ground. What about ground hollows? We certainly do do a lot of ground hollows, and that's viable. A whole lot of replanting in the last 20, 30 years. Yep. Is there a possibility that we could be doing this sort of nest boxing in those newly planted areas? Absolutely. So it would depend on the size of the stem if you're going to carve directly into trees, and if they're, they're not at the size, go to the next best thing. You carve salvage logs and you install them. And they then provide spaces for fauna to come in. Think about doing small hollows. You might be able to do little entrances, have little cavities that the entrances remain open. That provides space for things like antichinus, possibly feather tail gliders. Pardalotes will use very small sites like that. And by providing that, they're all the ecosystem services that those species are providing, like pest control and whatever else, uh, fertilising of forests, come into your planted area. And over time, that cavity will grow and develop. So you've effectively brought forward the time that hollows are forming in that forest by 70 years, effectively. And, and it becomes a really good option. So. What a cracker of a tree! <laughs> It's definitely huggable. It is, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely majestic structure, amazing, amazing tree. It's big enough that you could put substantial hollow. So we had 10 or 15 of those in this valley on your property. I would say, let's use this as your habitat tree. We'll leave the others alone at the moment and we won't touch them. And we'll have one tree that we're then gonna carve multiple hollows with different entrances and different chamber sizes on different locations in the tree. We might do some where we go direct in stem, some on side limbs, and some where we're going direct in end of branch or we're coming up underneath the branch to carve out. We might find that over time that there's been a snap out or a snap out or a branch that snapped off in one of these stems. You could work through the end of that and carve yourself a hollow. That tree there is sizable enough that you 100% could put a powerful owl hollow in something that size. You could put four or five small parrot and squirrel glider, sugar glider size hollows in that. So stuff for any kind of stuff for whatever. Easy. It's probably got a 20, 30, 40 year lifespan, maybe. Something like that. Old, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, perfect spot here. Tree's already starting to wrap its new, kind of trying to close that off. You could put a hollow somewhere into that, maybe into here as well. 
you know that tree itself is not going to last forever. It's already got some dead sections in the top of it. You could already be, you know, you could, the dead section up top, micro bats, get a chainsaw and just carve big long slots through that section. And there you've already got it space made. So um, lots of options in something even that small for smaller fauna. Yeah. And it might be that you're creating spaces for antichinus, feather tail gliders, fr tree frogs, um, spiders or whatever else that all form part of that system and they all get eaten so some of the hollows we get they'll be webbed up and then you'll come back in a week's time and the webbing's gone and the spider that used to inhabit that space has gone too yep. and it's probably ended up as dinner for something quite you know that was very pleased to have it so thank you very much <laughs> so it's like a lad, and they're 28 years old how interesting mm -hmm. So in that forest, I'd be looking to do salvage log. Yeah. If that was what I had to work with, I'd be finding spaces and installing them. Say we didn't have these big structures to work yeah. with, you could easily put um, hollows back up for, for fauna in that way. If we lose those hollows in our landscape, and especially on um, private land tenure, we lose the opportunity to have those species inhabiting those forests and to provide the ecosystem services that fauna provide so major pollinators major seed dispersers um, and they'll also fertilize forests um, so um, just through moving through the forest and doing what they do as well as pest control so a lot of species will eat the, the invertebrates that inhabit a forest and or surrounding lands so the landowner provides the space and landowners then protect their land. And there's so many people out there that are really keen to protect their, their land. By able, being able to reintroduce hollows, we're providing those spaces for fauna to persist into the future. And it's a critical thing at this time when we realize that we're having changes from climate um, impacts, as well as um, lots of uh, uh, deforestation that's occurred in the past and where the forests are in their re repairing state. Often that remnant forest may also provide um, space for fauna to breed and live that will then radiate out into surrounding lands. So it's not only just that small portion of land, we might be affecting for hectares and hectares around as well. Uh, we're really interested in the tree hollows, yes, for the, for the animals, because you know when we moved to our block, it was a very sterile block. And even though we have uh, fenced off areas, uh, there's not a lot of the hollows happening yet. Even though we have left the odd dead, well, any dead trees that were there, we have actually left. So, yeah. So just a way of getting, increasing the biodiversity on our block, I guess. Yeah. We put some hollows up trees, but this is a better method. Yes. Because ours fall out or they get disjointed and yeah. this really works. Yeah. yeah. So it's really good. So just by providing that opportunity for the trees to continue to grow in a space and for understory to develop and other habitat elements that's providing effectively a, a really good kind of way to do it there's nothing more exciting than um, putting a hollow into a, a landscape and coming back after a few months and finding that you've got a glider living in it or a parrot nesting in it and knowing that there's potential that that hollow will be there in another 120 to 200 to 300 years time, still providing habitat for fauna. Can I just say, yeah. I'm just going to go and help. Thank you so much. Thank I've you been very fascinating. Much. I don't right. think anybody can keep me. <laughs> yeah, we'll have, yeah, have a look at that. Oh, isn't that good? Oh, I'm glad you liked it.